I think we'll go ahead and get started. I'm Larry Wright. I'm a PA for the PMO at the Triple Office and uh, serving as your moderator today. And it's my pleasure to introduce uh, John McAdams. Uh, and if you're in the looking for the Tismo presentation, you're in the right place. If you're not, then feel free to leave right now. Or stay. Anybody gets out of hand? Um, you know. Some the cops have to squirt you out of the building. But, uh, that hasn't happened yet. So, Anyway, um, we have John here this morning. John has worked in operations for the Ohio Department of Transportation for 13 years. He currently oversees the Office of Traffic Management. His team is responsible for ODOT's TISMO efforts, and I'll let him tell you what TISMO is, because it's one of those acronyms that I've been here almost two years. I still don't know all the, all the acronyms, so I'm not working on it. Uh, the Statewide Traffic Management Center, Freeway Safety Patrol, ODO, which is ODOT's Travel and Information System, ODOT's Weather Management Efforts, Ohio Traffic Incident Management and Emergency Operations. And I'm sure there's many other things that John does. Uh, John and his wife Ashley have two wonderful children, Landon and Ellie. John is a proud graduate of the Ohio State University. And John is passionate about solving problems using technology. So, so. Thank you, Larry. Um, if you're bored, we're in a preschool room, and so there's lots of props up there. <laughs> Got rhinos, oranges, picnic tables, whatever you might need. There you go, Mike. Um, I get that same introduction last week at, in Michigan at a conference in Michigan. And I was surrounded by uh, four Michigan DOT employees, and the moderator was the district engineer over the Ann Arbor district, and he didn't quite read that sentence about proud graduate of the Ohio State <laughs> University the same way. But <laughs> I couldn't refute it uh, coming off that Urban Meyer thing. I just kept my mouth shut and moved on. But I'm glad to be back in Ohio talking to a more friendly crowd. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about TISMO. This, this probably will be uh, not your most technical um, presentation. You're going to get to see a little bit more of the business side, but it should become clear throughout the whole thing. I'll just tell you the punchline right away. Uh, TISMO is just a fancy word, like an umbrella, like a program. But it's a lot of what ODOT business does, operations, making traffic move. Uh, in fact, if you, if you go right to ODOT's mission statement, um, anybody know the mission statement? That's right. Provide easy movement, people in good, place to place, place, place. We will take care of what we have. That's a lot of what asset management's doing, and we will make our system work better. That's what Tismo. And a great place to work. And then uh, you through that you enhance capacity and increase safety, right? So you kind of put those last three parts together. Make our system work better. That's what that's what Tismo is trying to do. Um, you can think of it anything above the, the surface, right? The assets are the assets, the bridges, the roads, right? It's not all the assets themselves. But what's, what's happening above there with the traffic, that's what Tismo is really focused on. Operation, how is it flowing, right? So here's kind of an outline I have. I didn't realize when I signed up for this that it was over an hour. So <laughs> um, feel free to ask questions. Uh, come up and get your props, whatever, help, help me uh, stress this out. So four topics, what is TISMO? I'll try to define that as best I can. What does ODOT's TISMO program look like? Because like I said, we've been doing a lot of it. A lot of it involves technology. Some of it low tech, some of it high tech. We'll, you'll see that throughout. A lot of it uses devices, on network devices on the roads. A lot of it uses data, data analysis. So you'll see that theme throughout. Um, and then specifically, how, how are technology and, and TISMO kind of dancing together, right? They, they, they intertwine a lot. And I think you can kind of, if we kind of step back and just look, not that long ago, just like a 10-year story, how quickly the technologies advance and how ODOT has supported those advancements, especially in this world of operations. Um, and then the data, this data is not only a big piece right now for tracking performance measures and, and helping us plan our investments, but it's, it's going to be an even bigger piece. How do we analyze how we're doing, plan for operations, and then put uh, that information out there so that others can use it. And we're going to tell a couple stories there. Okay, 
I'll do my best to define Tismo. I'm not a big fan of words, so I'm going to skip all the words, but it's basically everybody's involved. It's not just a group. We all kind of help facilitate making our system work better in one way or the other. And it's alternative ways to use what we have to both reduce recurring congestion and non-recurring congestion. And when you, when you reduce congestion, you're also increasing safety. Recurring congestion is rush hour. Everybody familiar with recurring congestion? Everybody stuck with it? <laughs> you know where it's coming. It's the same yesterday as it is today. It'll be the same next week, right? That's recurring congestion. And then non-recurring congestion. This is really a lot. So there's TISMO strategies. TISMO, Transportation Systems Management and Operations, right? You don't need to remember that. Remember, make our system work better. But there's little strategies or technologies for each of these, and we'll kind of walk through that. Non-recurring, you get things like weather. So if it a big storm comes through in the middle of the day when you wouldn't normally have recurring congestion, it's going to jack up traffic. Same with work zones. We know that can impact traffic, although ODOT does a pretty good job at minimizing the impact. Special events, the Saturday, Rutgers is coming into town, traffic on 315 is going to be jacked up, right? Um, and then, of course, crashes is a huge part of non-recurring congestion. So it's different strategies to help mitigate the impact of recurring congestion and non-recurring congestion. That's one definition. Um, and, no surprise, it uses a lot of technology. There's a lot of roadside devices, there's a lot of tools, a lot of data being collected, a lot of information being put out to the public. You're about to run into the back of a queue. You're, you're faster to go on this route than that route, right? So there's a lot of technology that's involved in some of these strategies. We'll dive more into the strategies here. Uh, another good way to explain this is you just look at the typical congestion pie chart from the federal highways. So there's a recurring congestion in an urban area like Columbus, right? 40% roughly can be attributed to that recurring congestion, those bottlenecks. But then the rest of it is this non-recurring, 25% incidents, 15% bad weather, 10% work zones, poor signal timing and special events. Those kind of round out the majority of your, of your uh, congestion sources. And yeah, there you go, recurring, non-recurring. And like I said, there's strategies for each of those. Let me run back. So, anybody heard of what we're doing with hard shoulder running on 670, right? That is addressing a very uh, recurring and um, big problem. It's one of the worst travel time reliabilities on 670. Um, way over congested. If anybody drives through there in the afternoon, you know it's a nightmare, and that's every afternoon. But, think about how ODAP normally solves problems like that. It is very expensive if we want to put a new lane all the way through there. When you only really need that extra lane for two or three hours a day to get traffic through in the afternoon. So the strategy there that is being implemented and for the first time piloted in Ohio is open up the shoulder using technology, devices over the road saying, okay, now you can go in this lane. Here's the speeds we're gonna have you travel. We'll dive into that more, um, some of these strategies. But it's a, it's a, it's a TISMO strategy that uses the, just enough technology so it's a much cheaper implementation than act, um, getting the right of way, putting a new lane all the way through when you only need it for a few hours on weekdays, right? So there's strategies there. Lots of strategies for traffic incidents that we're going to talk about. Um, traveler information is a big strategy. Telling people where the problems are. Um, telling people when they're going to run into the back of the queue. Um, there's lots of partnerships involved that don't involve any technology, right? Working with uh, fire, police, tow companies. We even pay heavy tow companies to get semis cleared quickly at ODOT. So a lot of things we do, we can't stop all the incidents. So when they happen, one of the things Tismo's focused on is how quickly do we clear traffic back to normal, right? Bad weather. We do a lot of, obviously, uh, weather management, responding to weather and getting roads back to normal is one of the things that ODOT is very good at. Uh, a huge portion, more than half of ODOT staff is involved in some way in clearing snow and ice in some way supporting those efforts, getting traffic back to normal. We know that snow impacts Ohio a lot. So there's a lot of strategies we can do there. We'll talk about some of the performance measures. Work zones, there's, there, there's lots of technology you've probably driven through some of them. Variable speed limits for work zones, right? Telling people how, how close they're getting to the queue. Um, poor signal timing, right? Retiming the signals, maintaining the detectors, etc. You can, you can increase um, travel time through very, very cheaply. Special events. We know a lot when there's a concert coming through every year, when there's a football game, getting uh, messages ahead of time, getting uh, technology devices set in place ahead of time, right? 
So there's, the point here is there's strategies for each of these, and it is not restricted to the urban area. This is a rural area. You see, bottlenecks is basically gone in most rural areas. You don't have it. There's just not enough traffic. But look how important these other strategies become. Specifically, traffic <coughs> incidents. Traffic incidents in an urban area, as soon as there's a crash, if there's a crash on downtown 70, 71 to split right now, so there'll be flashing lights there within minutes. Tons of people responding. And there's also lots of ways, alternate routes around it. In the rural area, these are mostly volunteer responders. They're not going to get there right away. Sometimes ODOT's first on scene, and there's not as many detour routes. So traffic can uh, uh, oftentimes be impacted worse in the rural areas. Um, and so we got to plan for that, and we got to almost take more leadership as, as the Department of Transportation in the rural areas. Okay, so uh, another, to kind of wrap out the definition, please interrupt if you have any questions, but uh, we're, we're going to show some of the things that you probably have, are already familiar with that fit into this whole TISMO umbrella. Familiar with OGO, uh, hopefully it's a website and an app where we turn a lot of the information and data that's collected through all these roadside devices and we put it out to the public. I mentioned traffic incident management. Um, we have a statewide TMC that manages incidents. Um, there's a picture of them. Um, they use a lot of this technology. There's millions of dollars invested in roadside devices and networks, cameras, and speed data. And they use radios, and they're talking to folks on the ground. And their, their primary focus is twofold. Get the information out to the public so they know where the problems are. And then work with the incident responders to get it clear as quickly as possible by providing information, answering questions, et cetera. And then you, this is more TISMO elements. I mentioned those devices. Travel time boards, the EMS boards, telling people how, how quickly their travel times are and their, yes? I drive by those travel times every day. How often are they updated? Every minute. Every minute they... That's fast enough for me. Yeah. Every minute. <laughs> Oh. Yeah. Oh. yeah, and the data's not 100% accurate, but it's good enough to tell you which way is faster. And that's the intent. Which way is going to be quicker for you? That's How do they, question. where do they pull their data from? So, I'm going to tell a fun story about where we, where we pull that speed data from um, later on. But it's right now, at this point in time, we buy that data as one big feed from a data provider. That data provider collects it from cell phones. They collect it from uh, partnerships with freight companies, with um, GPS devices in your vehicle. They scrape data from places like ODOT where we have, they, they, they just combine as much data sources as they can. They get it from all the places. And then they sell it back to us. Yeah, that's the sell it back to us. But we were through that, and we're going to talk about how technology is advancing. We used to have to have loops in the road which are a nightmare to maintain. They're only limited to where you have it, and way more expensive, and they're not reliable. They would break all the time. We would have to fix it. You have to close the lane to fix it, which defeats the whole purpose of having it there in the first place. So it used to be much harder. And then we moved on to roadside devices that don't get in the lanes, so they're easier to maintain, and they're collecting it for both directions. That was, like, amazing. And so we could, like, double our number of miles that we had speed data for, and like cut the cost in half. And we did that for four, five, six years. And then all of a sudden, we realized we could just buy this from a company. They'll give us every road that ODOT cares about. If you go on to OGO right now, you see how, many, how much speed we have. It's all over the place. And again, the price went down, and we increased our number of routes. That's just how technology goes, right? So constantly evolving. We have to keep up with it. Um, more strategies. I'll dive into this one on, the, on another slide coming up. A lot of it is, is um, like I said, working with roadside responders doesn't involve any technology. It involves collaboration, right? Um, helping the state farm trucks, right? That's a contract that ODOT manages. <clears throat> 25 or so vehicles around the state in major urban areas. Their job is to help people when they break down, get back on the road so they're not going to make another incident happen behind them, or assist at the scene of an incident. So when patrol or another incident responder says, hey, we need your help, help us set up traffic control to keep this zone safe and to keep, you know, help us facilitate getting the lanes back open quickly. That's what, that's what this group is out there for. And then the TRIP program. This is the Towing Recovery Incentive Payment Program. Every interstate, every freeway in the state of Ohio 
has at least two heavy tow companies pre-qualified and on a contract with ODOT. And if an incident happens with a large vehicle, let's say a semi, Jack Nicer somehow gets in an accident and it's going to impact traffic on that freeway. The TMC calls the pre-qualified tow company that's closest, says you have 45 minutes to get to the scene, and you have 90 minutes to clear that, that heavy vehicle and get the lanes back open. If they meet those timestamps, ODOT pays them $2,500. Um, and it, it has drastically reduced how long it takes to clear. Because historically, those are some of the ones that take hours to clear. When a, when a heavy vehicle is involved. So uh, the majority of those are successful when they get the payment and the lanes get back open. Cheap investment for ODOT. <laughs> One other thing I want to mention, it, maintenance. A lot of what our maintenance side of ODOT does uh, kind of uh, goes along with this idea of making our system work better, being more efficient. And they're constantly looking at ways to use technology to help their mission. So one of the programs, they have uh, six or 700 or so of their uh, plow trucks equipped now with these GPS ABL technology that tells you where they are. It has a camera so the manager can log in. It leaves a footprint of where they've been. And they remotely, managers can see what routes they've hit. Are they dropping salt? Do they have their plow down? Right? What are the road conditions where they are? And then they, it's just a way to be more efficient using that technology as we manage their, their county. Right? And so I think their goal is by the end of next year to have every one of ODOT's fleet um, equipped with this technology. Right, then it generates reports. Another thing um, is the idea of uh, sharing our resources, right? This doesn't, again, this is a fairly low tech solution, but uh, if anybody here from the northern part of the state, okay, even if you're not, you should know they get a lot of snow up there, right? <laughs> Right, good point. We are in September. So they get enough snow to where the county forces in these counties here in red, a typical lake effect snowstorm will overwhelm. It'll be more snow than ODAC can handle from our resources. When I say resources like drivers, trucks, salt, right? It's, we just don't have enough to keep up with it. So they come up with these, these plans, these agreements. Okay, if this type of a storm happens, we're going to be over utilization. So we're going to be over 100%. These counties, they're going to be, they got about right what they need, right? Yellow counties, okay, maybe you're underutilized and you go down. So they all have to make a plan. We're literally going to shift our resources up. Um, and everybody's going to help each other. And we're going to, we're going to tackle this together. Again, this is being efficient, right? Takes planning. Okay, so any question on what TISMO is? Any clarification? A lot of it is just an umbrella for a lot of what we already do. Now I'm going to talk about what we're emphasizing on through ODOT TISMO program. Okay, I don't know the rules of this um, conference, but I'd like you to get out your phone. Um, so, welcome to follow along. If you go to TISMO at ODOT.com, I want to tell just a little bit of the background as to how we got to where we are with an actual program and a plan and all this other stuff. <coughs> T-S-M-O-A-T-O-Dot.com. So it should work from your phone. Give me a couple seconds to load that up. <coughs> Anybody get it to work? Yep. Take some heads on. Okay. So if you don't if you can't get it. I got a scam advisor. What's that? Scam advisor. Uh-oh. That's not good. <laughs> okay, so this is a quick timeline. I want to just tell the background of how White ODOT started the TISMO program in the first place, what we did to get to an actual program and a plan, right? Because you just saw a whole number of those things we've been doing for years. ODOT does operations. ODOT deploys these technologies. But the one thing we've been missing is a comprehensive plan, right? So let's, let's talk through that. So uh, back in April 2013, more than five years ago, the feds granted ODOT money out of their Shark 2 program. This is one of their uh, and it was their Organizing for Reliability initiatives. This is the Fed saying DOTs uh, need to look at their business model and they need to focus a little bit more on travel time reliability, right? Um, we do a lot, number of things, but how much of our business supports organizing our resources and our efforts on operating the system to in increase travel time reliability? <coughs> And so one of the first things they had us do was perform a self-assessment. That's what the CMM is. 
We analyzed what we're good at, what we're not so good at, and then we went out and we visited nine states that do some of those things a little bit better than us. We even had a few IT managers join us on this. We had local cities and counties join us. We had um, MPOs join us. So we, we put a fairly big group of people that care about ODOT and Ohio transportation go help us figure out what other states are doing better. Came back with a whole bunch of recommendations. Oh, you can't see this, can you? Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good. Good. Came back with a whole bunch of recommendations. It was a little bit overwhelming, quite frankly. Uh, so we decided to hire a consultant. July of 2016, we hired a consultant and we said, help us put together a comprehensive plan. We need a TISMO plan. This is what most states were also doing. And then we put together some oversight of the, for the development of this plan. We had a technical advisory committee. We had a steering committee. Technical Advisory Committee, they were getting into the weeds of the recommendations. Steering Committee was more focused on big picture, how we're going to integrate this into the culture, the policies, all that kind of stuff. And then they oversaw the development of the plan, interviewed a lot of people, and a number of IT folks participated in those interviews and workshops. Um, we did a, a, a self-assessment again to see if we were getting any better. Again, I mentioned these workshops. We had representatives from all, all districts and most sides of the shop, right? The construction, planning, operations, maintenance kind of figured out, did a couple workshops, what do we want to do, what do we want to prioritize, came back with a draft plan in May of 2017, and gave ODOT a whole bunch of recommendations, and again, it was a draft plan, but true to operations, we began implementing a number of those recommendations before we even accepted the final plan, and I'll go through some of these later. Uh, one of the things I'm going to highlight is our TISMO Council, so what used to be the steering committee became our TISMO Council, which still exists and uh, recommended TISMO coordinators in each district. I'll talk through that. And third workshop to present those findings, officially adopted the TISMO Council last July. We reorganized our central office division of operations slightly in August, reclassified TMC. So these, these things through here are the things that we were told to do. And I'm gonna cover some of these uh, in the rest of the presentation, especially variable speed on the pilot, that's a fun story to tell. But the plan wasn't adopted until earlier this year, January, February of this year. And then there's been some ongoing development, which I'll talk through some of. And if you're real curious, at the bottom there's a link if you want to actually read the plan. So that's just a little bit of background as to, that's a five year story of how we came together with this plan and where we are and where we formally accepted a program plan earlier this year. Okay, so what is our plan? I'm not gonna go through it because it's a lot. It is a goals and objectives brief, which talks about the background. It's a setting the stage, which talks about what the feds are doing, what other DOTs are doing. Resource alignment, how should ODOT, ODOT reorganize its people and finance to support and wanting to support this. Policy action, this is the meat and potatoes. 48 pages telling us, hey, what do you need to do? Right, you need to implement this program, you need to um, try this pilot, you need to tweak this around. Like, this is the actual like, good stuff. <clears throat> Performance measures brief. How do you know if you're being successful? What things matter? Travel time reliability, uh, clearance times, and we'll talk about some of these. What, do, what can you do first? Right, early action implementation plan, which we, we took a lot of, and then there's a, somehow the page summary ended up being like 30 pages. So, <clears throat> 183 pages, but what, what have we done? <clears throat> Mentioned a few things. We, we, like I said, we rolled out our TISMO Council. It's very similar to that um, IT Council and the Funding Council, right? They oversee the development of everything that's being integrated into the culture. They set the priority, right? And they remove any hurdles. District TISMO coordinators. Each district now has an assigned TISMO coordinator who coordinates all the efforts regionally, work with all the business units at, at the district work with local incident responders, local planners, other local uh, entities, cities, whatever, and they coordinate a lot of the efforts. We had a slight central office uh, TO change. I'll show you what we did here. This was our division. These were our five offices. Maintenance <coughs> ops, emergency ops, permits, traffic ops, slash ITS, and aviation. We made a new office traffic management and we moved all these little dark boxes into there, right? So basically anybody that was kind of focused on traffic management initiatives, such as the emergency operations and incident management folks, they came in. Um, the TMC and some of the data analysis group came in, and the one, one guy from maintenance, the weather uh, management. So we kind of brought all those sort of, uh, 
folks that, are, if you go back to that pie chart, that were working on those very strategies of those non recurring congestion, you put them into one, one office. So, not a, not a big shift. One, uh, one last thing I'd like to bring up that we've done. A big takeaway from the findings were, hey, ODOT, you do a lot of operations, but you do it without a plan. You just kind of ad hoc put stuff out there. And it helps, but you should be a little more strategic with it. So we came out with, uh, we we're actually just about to release this next week, a, a tool called Toast that brings in all this data, travel time reliability, clearance times, how quickly we clear incidents, bottlenecks, where's the congestion in the state, that's really the big focus of this, um, and uh, a couple other things, there's a safety factor, there's a couple other factors in here that basically says, oh, how, how, how much do we respond to winter weather? So it basically says, these are your corridors that need the most work from an operations perspective, from a congestion perspective, from a reliability perspective, and it's going to help us rank by district, here's the routes we need to look at. It's very similar, anybody uh, familiar with our safety program? How they come out with priority lists. It's very similar to that. It would just be more congestion and reliability focused. And then there's strategies with each of these to um, say, okay, if you rank really badly because of travel time performance, maybe you need to implement an advanced technology solution. Some of those things we've already covered. Okay, that is it from a culture back. I'm sorry, that section was probably a little boring. So we're going to get into what I think is more exciting. We're going to get into a project. So is anybody familiar with our variable speed limit pilot project in Lake County up on I-90? <clears throat> I'm going to see some heads on. Okay. Uh, June, oops, terrible. June of last year, Ohio Revised Code, the legislator said, okay, ODOT, we're going to give you the authority to try variable speed limits as a strategy. And we're going to give you three routes, one of them being I-90. <clears throat> I think they gave us the authority from 71 all the way out to the state border to the east. And they said, you can implement variable speed limits. First, you have to come up with a policy of how you're going to do that. That's, that's basically what's written in the, in the code. And why, why, did, uh, why, did, why did we want to move first on I-90? So they have this thing called snow squalls that happen up uh, off the lake. It is very targeted, very unreliable, and it can reduce visibility like that. Um, sometimes without very much warning. Here's a look at the right, look at the zoomed in version. Look how targeted that storm can become. It can just nail one section of roadway and it's gone. And it causes, as you would expect, a lot of problems. This is, uh, this is what a snow squall looks like. This is actually one from Columbus. But look at the timestamp. This is 1404. Just less than an hour earlier, we did not doctor this at all. This was the visibility through that same camera. And again, I'll go back. This is what happened an hour later. That's what a snow squall does. It comes out of nowhere. It completely blinds drivers, and then it's gone. Right? So it, it's a traffic nightmare. And if you mix that with lake effect snow, for the past who knows how many winters, they've had multiple pileups on 90. Some of them pretty bad. So you get things like this. You get one guy in a wreck, so usually it's a heavy vehicle. Nobody has time to see and react in time to slow down. So there's multiple pileups. So it's a big problem. Up up there. Again, we want to keep this from turning into this. Right? So, and this. Right? Nobody wants this. USA Today, 50 car pile up, took us 14 hours to clear. I mentioned one of our performance measures is how quickly we clear traffic back to normal. Our goal is not 14 hours. Do you, do you still pay those big truck collar or you know the tow uh, in something like that? Uh, I would. This would be this would be beyond the trip program. Yeah, <laughs> and they would uh, they would not they would not admit an incentive payment for this. Yeah. We would we probably wouldn't have called the trip. <laughs> okay, so let's tell a little bit of story. The before traffic impact before December of 2016. We had that was the that was the USA Today 50 car pileup. There was one heavy vehicle who got jackknifed, and as you can see, conditions were such that nobody could stop 50 car pileup. Lots of serious injuries. Took forever to clear. Um, there was communications issues. It, 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 it's, it, the incident turns into a very difficult thing to manage, right? So it became a big problem for a while. Both directions were shut down. Um, huge impact. So. 
This last winter that we just came through, we implemented our first variable speed limit pilot project. This is what it looked like. We kind of had to rush the technology, so it was out on uh, uh, temporary, um, this looks like a work zone trailer, right? But it worked. It looks like a regulatory zone. Let me be clear, this is, a, this is not like a work zone speed limit. This is an act, you're changing the actual statutory speed. And so I had to come up with a policy that said, when you see these conditions, this is the new speed limit. When it snows this much, the visibility reduces or that the road conditions uh, get impacted, you have to lower the speed limit accordingly. And so we did that last winter. We had, uh, there's a section of 90 that centers on Vrooman Road that um, we, we had about eight signs, four in each direction. So not full build, but it was enough that we could lower the speed where it mattered, when it mattered. This is what we're rolling out this year, right? This is the full technology, fully connected. Uh, into our network, it looks more like a speed limit sign. Again, still fully dynamic, we can change that. And there's going to be 19 of them, some of them on ramps. Got the, they're a little tighter spaced. And now, we're gonna, this year, we're going to be able to change the speeds only where the conditions work. Yes? Now, are they, they're using those in construction zones as well, correct? Because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. I think I drove through that section of roadway this summer. Okay. And I certainly saw the, the speed limit variable signs, but it looked like there was roadway construction going on as well. Yes. Okay. They do use these. Um, they use, we use work zone speed limit reductions when there's contractors present. Um, there's different limits based on if there's physical protection or not for the workers. That's a different policy from this. This is actually changing the statutory speed with or without work based on conditions. As a driver, it was very interesting because it, it, as an ODOT person, I pay more attention to speed zones and work right. zones. Right. But seeing that it was you know, posted at 65, 70 miles an hour during that time, I'm like, oh, that's great. You know, I'm yeah. gonna keep going. Go right through. And hopefully that makes people, when they see the lowered speed limit, pay more attention to it. When, Good point. When they go through it. And that was a big learn lesson learned last year. Uh, when we first started, so last December, uh, we were tried and true, we're gonna trust the data. And when the data tells us we need to drop it down to 60, we gotta drop it down to 60 because pavement conditions says that it's slippery, right? And turns out we gotta put a little dose of reality in there with that because we, our, our end goal is to get people to actually slow down, right? And if we change it too frequently, they're not gonna listen to it. So we started to work with Lake County staff and we started to also look at traffic speeds. So if Lake County was telling us the road is fine, the conditions are fine, if it looked good through cameras, and if speeds were still at 73, that means people still felt comfortable traveling at 73. We waited, and then when conditions actually started to worsen, people slowed down, county confirmed, then we would lower the speeds, right? So we didn't want to jump the gun just because the data was telling us. And, and those, are, those weather stations are not perfect anyway. So that's another John, answer. so on the yeah. old trailers, they had uh, beacons. They had, had beacons that yeah. flashing. Does the new ones have that as well? Not yet. Because I was wondering, 70 is obviously your normal speed, and yep. then if it drops down, to me, those beacons bring the attention. That the speed it tells you something different. Yeah, but what's not shown here, actually, it is showing. Um, this, there's a message board preceding the zone in each direction that only gets lit up when the speeds are dropped. Okay. It says, as you're coming in, speed's reduced because of whatever, visibility, precipitation, whatever. So you, if you're entering from outside the zone, it'll tell you, Hey, your speeds are reduced. We're, we still are investigating putting those beacons back in because we agree. We think they actually help draw attention to the speed limit sign. Yeah. That's a long. That's a long stretch just to have. Twelve miles. Yeah. I wanted. Yeah. At the end. Yeah. Is there entrances and exits within the zone? Yeah. There's a couple yeah. entrances, and we have speed limit signs on the ramps when you're coming in. Yeah. But they're still going to be traditional looking. Correct. So to speak. Correct. Yeah. They're going to look like this. Yep. So John, on on your point to the. ORC and the regulatory portion, right? So you review crashes and you'll see citations that I would troll or some other kind of law enforcement officer will give and say, they'll still cite an individual even even though they weren't exceeding the speed limit, but they'll say exceeding, you know, exceeding speed, reasonable speed they'll conditions. They'll say driving unsafe for conditions. Yes, yes, yeah. yes. We work so, with them on that. Yeah. So does, so now let's say we drop it to 50 and and somebody, you know, the law enforcement's out there catches something, somebody going 60 or 75, then it's it's still Yeah, it's a statutory it's still a violation. Speed. They actually did write a couple tickets for folks going over our reduced speed. Gotcha. That was um, where and I was what going. we did with them was I'll show this tool. Let me see, here's the tool. Actually, you know, I just pull it up. Um, we have this tool that 
crafted very carefully with a lot of feedback from them. One of the things they, they were very concerned about is how do we know when you change the speed? We need to know. We can't just trust, we can't just look at the signs, we need to know. They were, they were very vocal about that. So we um, implemented, a, in our, it's, it's really not super techy, I'll show you. We implemented a, the ability to quickly email a group and they all put their emails on that group and then some of them put like their cell phone even like number 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 at verizontech.com or whatever so they knew as soon as we changed the speed they all got notified and i'll talk about what we're going to do this year with it too um, let me pull up this tool and show you how this worked okay this is the tool we used last year we have a more robust tool this year. But, here we go. Very similar to what you see back there, I'm gonna this out. So what this tool is, it's a, re it's a visual representation of the road, right? Nothing's actually gonna change, it's just telling you recommendations. And based on the policy, so one of the things is the National Weather Service issue a snow squall alert. If so, drop everything to 60, I'm gonna change that back to the middle. And you'll see the recommendation up here is now 70. The operators can hit, and this is run through our statewide TMC, they can hit refresh the Arbus data, it connects to our data provider, pulls those site uh, weather stations and brings back the results. Looks like it's not having a good time with that right now. But it will then recommend, hey, here, you should probably be thinking about lowering this to 60 or whatever based on the conditions. This is great. If it comes back, <coughs> So right up here, there was a little email button. As soon as they change the speeds, they come back here, they hit save speeds, which logs it. So we have to, we have to log when the speed limits were changed. And then it pops up, opens Outlook, it's like a mail team link that says, hey, email this notification group. So immediately they see which sign is what speed, right? Of course, when they can't do that, because this is not having a good time. But um, again, so this, was, this made it very efficient for them to be very quick. When the conditions were changed, they could quickly react to it. So you have to log it due to uh, RC? Or? Correct, yeah, we're required to log when the speeds were changed. So we changed it 230 one time last year, and I'll show where we did that. So it's a manual process, like somebody has to kind of keep on top of it? Yeah, this requires an operator in the TMC to watch the data. That was a change. This, is, this really changed, and this is part of the TISMO recommendation. We're not just monitoring traffic anymore, now we're moving into managing it, right? Same with what we're going to do in that hard shoulder right. You're going to be opening and closing a lane to live traffic, okay? We're not just recommending that people avoid an area. We're telling them where you need traffic, so we're, we're truly managing traffic. There's also this static sign that goes in before the zone. Uh, there's that policy I mentioned, basically, when you meet these conditions, you're fine, keep it at 70. If you meet any of these conditions, drop it down to 60. If you meet any of these conditions, drop it down to 50, etc. So, Are those requirements? To drop it now, Those, or you said that now, last year you went strictly off of that, thou shalt do this. Correct. That, those right. are, that is ODOT's controlled policy, so it is somewhat flexible. Okay. Um, but it's, it's basically, if you meet these conditions, and there's, there's, there's smoothing factor, you don't want to change it every minute. Right. So like, if it stays there for a decent amount of time, you need to reduce the speed. Um, and we got a whole lot of snow last year, so we use it a lot. Um, they put us right in, in part of it was also how do we share this with the public so uh, District 12 who has a lot of Twitter Twitter followers put out tweets every time we change the speed limit we also sent out OGO alerts every time the speed limit was changed and uh, we heard from multiple folks that when some drivers saw these tweets they avoided the, the route they said I'm not going there oh, so that, we'll call that a success um, <laughs> And then here's the, again, it takes in pavement, temperature, precipitation type, visibility. Those are kind of the factors that determine when the speeds drop, right? Okay, so how do we do? We'll get to the results, right? Fun part. So in December, there, we just changed it a few times. I'm, I'm, I mean, November, sorry. December is when we got the lion's share of the changes. That's when we got the most winter. Right here, I'm going to highlight this incident in a minute. That was uh, a pretty serious jackknife semi incident that happened while we had the speeds drop down to 50. You can see we very quickly dropped it down to 30. And you'll see why. Um, January, February, and then the rest of the winter. So we changed it, like I said, 231 times. 
And we're, we're very happy. Now, this is comparing one winter to one winter, but we're going to claim success because we can. So look, look at the differences. We have national media, 50 car pile up, 14 hours. Remember those? And that was the winter before, the 15 to 16. Now we're talking 17 to 18. We had, who knows, local station. We had same type of incident, same type of conditions, but it opened within one hour. No secondaries, no serious crashes. So that was the one you saw on the results. We had it at 50, immediately when that semi jackknife, we lowered it down to 30, which is like the red button. That's like the worst we can go. <laughs> and again, we avoided the pile up, we avoided the serious injuries, we got it open within one hour. So we claim that as a success. And overall, what about those performance measures that we, the whole reason we do these strategies in the first place? <coughs> Winter before, the average time it took to clear the road from incidents was 112 minutes. All right? Nationally, you want to be below 90, so that's bad. When we had the VSL in place, the winter months, 81 minutes. Down over 31 minutes on both incident clearance and roadway clearance. There's some nuanced differences, but basically how quickly do we clear traffic back to normal? We reduce that time by 30 minutes. That's, that's a big win. And then crashes. Secondary crashes specifically are a huge problem in snow squalls. Um, nationally, the feds tell us roughly 20% of all crashes, you can say, on freeways, you can say are secondary crashes, meaning they happen because a queue that formed because of a previous incident, and that incident doesn't have to be a crash, it can be a disabled vehicle, whatever. So if there's a queue that wasn't expected, roughly 20% of those crashes nationally are secondary. So the winter before, we had 63 total crashes, almost half of them were secondaries. The winter we had this in, we, we first of all, we reduced the number of crashes, and we drastically reduced the percentage of secondaries, which is the goal here. Down almost 25% percentage of secondaries. Again, it's one winter comparison to one winter, but we're, we're claiming early success. Yes, Mike. So I'm just curious, like, obviously you guys are monitoring that incident and the visibility is low for sure, but can you see the traffic slowing at that, because you hit the, you lowered the speed limit, so you got incoming traffic without the variable speed limit, you're going to have those, you know, pal driving moms on SUVs that think they don't slide on snow going 75. Pal driving moms. That's the expression yeah. my life. But so they're going to be like getting there thinking that traction works because they have an SUV and the, you know, and well, with, with the 30 drop. It, you're, well, you're right. And, and this, this brings up a good point. Where are the conditions warranted? There's an Arbus station here. The speeds are dropped preceding that, coming into that. Right. And then when you're past it, you know, speeds are back to normal. In both directions, it's dropped. So when, when that specific incident happened, that we happened to have speeds drop on the whole corridor because it was bad enough throughout the whole thing, but we immediately dropped both directions coming into it down to 30. Right. So you're giving it the best chance of being able to slow down when you're dropping down to 30 miles an hour. Well, that's what I mean. I mean, if, if a person sees that radical change and it calls their attention, like when, when every, I mean, when you see 70 miles an hour, you're like, I you're can fine. do whatever. The yeah. cops are going to let me go 75, 80, and probably not even look at me. Not that I ever do that or anything. Right. But you drop it to 30, it's like, well, there must be a work zone. I mean, I'm, so I have to believe that that's calling attention, and that seems like a pretty effective strategy. It is. And, but but what, something that we learned when we researched this is you can't take advantage of that power. If you drop it too many times, and then somebody drives through there and says, I'm going to be going 40 right now, then they won't listen to you. So that's one thing we continue to, to train our operators. If, if, if your data is telling you one thing, you gotta, you got to kind of work with the traffic a little bit. It, you gotta, you gotta, our end goal is adherence. You're absolutely right. We want people to adhere to this. Um, and it's the same with, it's not an enforcement strategy. So if the patrol's not out there trying to just get this as a gotcha and write tickets, right? They're, they're, they're on board with this because they had, a, they had a sheriff killed in a secondary crash the year prior. So they want to reduce secondary crashes just as much as we do. Right? And so they're also helping with the communication, and that's our end goal is adherence. So this, but it's, but it's, I think it's also helping with the drivers, too, because a lot of times, defensively, you have to keep up with traffic because otherwise you're going to become the guy getting good point. cut off. So by dropping the speed limit, you can let them do what they should do, which is slow down instead of trying to keep up with, you know. Absolutely. Like, Good point. You're trying to keep up with that pile driver. Right. You're trying to, yeah. Yeah. You're trying to keep up and you're like, I want to be part of the pile just up. I just want to make sure I'm number 50 so I win a prize. Just okay. clear high. Just clear the lane. So you said the crashes, the 
got cleared a lot faster this year. Why is that? I understand there wouldn't be as much crashes. Um, one of the one of the biggest reasons is when you don't have the pile ups as quick. When you reduce secondaries, you're automatically going to increase your clearance times. But another thing is we're intrinsic. We're making that zone safer for them to work when when people are speeding up in the last second, slowing down. So they're less worried about what's happening behind them because traffic is basically crawling up to them. Um, and they can quickly, but I think honestly the bigger reason is when you only have one or two vehicles to clear, it's much quicker than when you have a lot of secondaries to deal with, right? It's just they kind of help each other. So do you have a, like a, a big curtain that goes up in the median? So when you have a jackknife semi on one side so you don't get all the rubbernecker crashes on the other because I can't see it. We don't, in this case, <laughs> but you'll see a lot of states uh, put those, those visibility sure, sure. guards. Yeah, I mean, that's a thing for sure. And that's a solution. If, if, so, if you get enough incidents. So a more, a more serious question. So you're, you're talking winter now, but are, are you also looking to use this for heavy rain events? And I don't know what kind of texture we have on the surface up there for so it splash, splash and spray can be a real big it issue. It technically can be used just okay. on rain. Okay. But it, it's a serious rain. Sure, sure. It doesn't sure. happen very frequently. But the next step we're looking at is beyond winter weather is congestion. Hits. Sure. Okay. So we'll also implement this policy as part of the hard shoulder running for 670. Because uh, when you have to move that so much traffic that you need to open up that extra lane on the shoulder, that means you need to reduce speeds. Right. Yeah, bring the speeds down because of the congestion to push more people through. And that's going to be that's going to be just as hard to sell as it is to get people to adhere to the speed limit drop because of weather. Because now, now you're having to explain to people, trust us, we're pushing more of you through by lowering your speed. That might not be immediately clear um, that you're going to increase throughput. But you need a banner that tells them that. Yeah. <laughs> what, what's the uh, answer going to be to the person that asks you, why can't we use that lane all the time on 6-7? That's a good question. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I, 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 I know that question is going to get Where's asked. Where's Nancy? I don't know. And then, yeah, I, I'm sure lots of folks are going to be interested. I know Drive Ohio is interested in what can we do on that lane. Yeah, it's, it's, yeah. A, it's a fair question. If if we if we can maintain it all the time, why not? It might not be safe at those higher speeds. Yeah. <laughs> no. yeah. Well, I would, I would probably argue that the real reason is that the moment you make more lanes, people change their traffic patterns, and now you just now you max capacity there. If you build, only do it strategically, yeah. then. You get those people taking the side roads, don't suddenly start using 670. Yeah. Good point. Yeah. 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 The other thing I'm wondering about is your data on these 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 variable speed limits. I'm curious to find out if you, with, when you get enough data, are you finding that traffic isn't coming onto the road now because you've reduced it and notified people? We haven't looked at volumes yet. Is that, uh, that we just looked at speeds. That's a good question. Yeah. We yeah. haven't looked to see volumes. That's, that's a, that's a that's your downstream yeah. volume reduction is yeah. also reducing yeah. your pilot. Sure. Definitely. If you're keeping people from coming in at all, that's going to help everything. Yeah. <laughs> no. so, looking at your uh, crash numbers, it didn't look like your primary incidents went down at all. It went down from uh, 63 to 48. No, that's your total. <coughs> oh, you're saying it's primary to our, Well, they're all, even so, the secondary ones count in total. Right, right. So if you take your total crashes up top, 63 minus the 30 secondary, you got 33. If you go down to your variable speed limit, 48 minus 11 is 37. Well, so that, that's not primary. That would be incidents that weren't a secondary. I don't know, I don't know what you would call that. Um, that. You know what I mean? That. Yeah, that's that's just a, that's just a factor of your total crashes. Really. You know, so total crashes went down, and then sec secondaries went down because total did, but also the percentage. Went down. Yeah. And really, one to one year is not a great right. comparison. Right. What we really should do at least three years. Well, yeah. Question: um, When you are in Ann Arbor, with other are other states uh, implementing something like this that, that come from the land of Marion County in Michigan, which yeah. is the Ashtabula? Okay. And they have the same pileups of I-94 right. going right by the lake. I can tell you that a lot of states are interested in this. The only thing similar right now is um, actually near Ann Arbor on 23, they have what they call a flex route, which is, is a hybrid of like our BSL and our hard shoulder running. So they, if they open up the shoulder and they, and they drop the speeds, um, I don't remember how long it is, uh, in both directions when traffic warrants it. So I think it's southbound in the morning and northbound in the afternoon. Um, and 
that, that, so that's a little bit more like our hard shoulder running. I think uh, some states out west have done variable speed limits because we, we learned from their recommendations before we did this. Um, and I know there's, a, there's other Great Lakes regions, states that are, that are thinking and planning to do the same thing. You know, in D.C., they have the extra lanes that they flip at the end of the day, you know, with time of time of day in order to get <coughs> traffic. And that's another strategy that, that is going to achieve the same type of results. So let, let me talk about what, so we're very happy with the results for this year, but we're, we're not going to stop. So, again, we're happy. Incident clearance time, 30 minutes, and cra secondary crash percentage down 25. So we're happy with those, but we're going to still, we're going to still move forward and expand it. So you already heard us talk about Last year we only had eight signs, this year we're going to have 19, so we're going to expand the technology. And now we're going to focus the speed drops only on the section where we had it. There's a couple incidents last year where the Lake County managers were telling us on this, the west end, we can't see a darn thing. It's, it's visibility zero. On the east end, it's sunny. And they weren't kidding, but our cameras confirmed this. So we're, and that's the nature of these snow squalls. So we're going to be focusing the speed limit drops where it's needed most and then the sections preceding that. So we're going to expand our technology and that, that goes along with the policy. We're going to increase communications. Uh, PIOs had a bigger impact than we expected quite frankly. Telling public when the speeds drop has a big impact and so some folks avoided the area completely when the PIOs put out that social media post. So we're going to get it to them directly and help them auto generate some of their uh, communications. Uh, we're not going to be piggybacking TMC staff that's trying to also manage another region. They're going to be focused fully on this zone. They're going to be using uh, more advanced, they're not going to be using a spreadsheet anymore. They're going to be using a full dedicated software, so we're going to go all in on that. And then this is probably the coolest one. I hope this works out. We're trying to get this to work. We're working with USDOT to put onboard units in all the highway patrol vehicles that go through this area. And as soon as we change the speed limit, it'll pop up on their in onboard unit and tell them speeds have been reduced and if they happen to be driving depending on where they are located it will say your current speed right here is 60 or 50 or whatever so uh, it looks like that's going to work out and we're excited to, to pilot that with them okay how are you going to do that I and mean, technology wise so usdot has a platform that they build it's like a data big database basically and they did it for um, it was either wyoming or, or Colorado is a state out there that has huge snow problems, very seasonal based, and um, they did the same thing. They put their vehicles with onboard units, and it goes through like I think it actually goes through Sirius, Sirius XM, and they read that database. And when we update it, it automatically feeds it into their units, like like an OnStar. Yeah, because my thought, my thought process is: is there some way maybe a voter public can subscribe to that? Good question. Yeah, that yeah. feed. Well, and we're gonna. You, you guys are stealing all the thunder. That's good. Sorry. No, but, but that's that's part of the whole this section three about how we view our role in traveler information. So let's let's get to that real quick. Um, so that I think we're done talking about what Tismo is, what ODOT's done. We gave enough of a taste of that. Now we're going to talk about um, how technology changes. This is going to play right into your question. How are we doing on time? All right. Okay. So. Let's just talk about how quickly this stuff changes. Uh, in the late 90s, uh, ODOT was, was involved in kind of a major player for releasing Artemis. This was one of the first big traffic management centers in the country, and it was down in the Cincinnati region, and it was a big deal, and it lasted for a long time, and did a lot of great things, but what was the state of technology back then? One of the primary technologies they used to do their job is speed data. They need to know how fast people are going. So they had, loops in the road wherever they wanted speed and these were a nightmare to install and maintain they cost a lot on both money and time and impact the traffic to maintain very intrusive and you were limited to wherever you put them and wherever they happened to be working that that really was not a great solution what they resorted to was they would have an operator literally watch a camera and say red truck watch a camera two miles down the road and say, there's the red truck, stop the stopwatch, I'm gonna guess the travel time, and put it up on the board. Because they trusted that more than they trusted the speed data. So that's what they were doing with technology then, right? Then, this was like a lifesaver. We put, we put these units on the roadway that could see both directions. You didn't have to block a lane to fix them. ODOT didn't even fix them, we hired somebody else to fix them. The costs went way down, we could put them on all interstates, basically. So that was a big deal. We had these for years, non-intrusive, and, and they let us provide the data local 
to all locals. The city of Columbus learned that speed data we give them. This was a big advancement in technology. And now we could trust the travel times. Now, now we didn't have to have an operator sit there and count red trucks going back and forth through the cameras. That was a big deal. And then just a few years ago, we completely got rid of all of those devices. We now have, as far as operations perspective, we now don't, tr we don't use any roadside devices for real-time speed data in the, in the traffic management center. We buy it from a company that collects it from all these different sources. Again, it now we expanded our <coughs> number of roads again. We reduced our costs again. That's just how technology goes. I'm probably preaching to the choir here. Um, we see weather data uh, following a similar path. It's just a little bit behind. Historically, it cost over $100,000 to install one of these weather stations. And they, so clearly, they were very limited. Then we're down to about $45,000. we actually come down just a little bit from that to install a whole station. And so we were able to expand them across the state. Ohio has probably more uh, more densely populated RWIS weather station system than any other state. Ohio's done very well. They're still kind of expensive to maintain, right? And we see weather data in the future becoming more modular. You don't need a whole $45,000 system if you just want to collect pavement conditions. You can just put in a pavement condition sensor, right? So they're becoming more modular based, and the data is becoming more and more reliable. And now we're starting to see these same type of companies that are selling speed data come and say, hey, we can also collect weather data. And so we see this following a very similar path in the future, where we won't need as many devices, we won't need to maintain them. So this is just technology helps us be more efficient moving forward. Um, and, and then this is to your question about what is our role in, in putting this information out to the public? Look at all the different ways that technology changes how we tell the traveling public what's going on. One of the first ways was through highway advisory radio. You see those signs that tell you, turn to 1460 if I'm flashing, right? Um, so that's again if you even have AM radio in your car now. But that was a big deal, right? Then we had a 511 system, call this number and go through the 800 menus to get to your route and then we'll tell you your travel time, right? That was a big deal when it came out. Then we started putting travel times on the message boards. Okay, now you're driving in a spot before you have to make a decision. You can see that one's quicker than that one, right? But those are fairly expensive. Now we're talking DDMS. These are the travel time boards. They look like regular static signs. They're green, right? Sometimes they're orange for work zones, and they have little digital inserts that tell you it's quicker to go on this route than that route. Who can put those in rural areas, and they're, they're, they're uh, pretty densely populated. Um, those are cheaper, and they just tell you, make this decision, go left or right. Oops. Oh, go website. Now you log on to a website before you even hit the road. Right? What, what's going on? No, before we go, okay. Looks like my road, I can go down 71. Maybe I need to take 315 today. And then we came out with personalized alerts. Now you don't even need to log on to OGO. OGO will send you a push notification if your route says there's something going on. See how, it, see how it just continues to advance, right? And then we put on OGO travel delay. Uh, we didn't even know this was going to be a popular feature, but you can turn on travel delay and, and it, you know, the, the maps are red, yellow, or green. Anytime there's a red, you don't really know how bad it is. <coughs> Travel delay tells you how many minutes is it going to take you to drive across that red segment. So it's very useful, it turns out. If it says a four, you're going to be all right. If it says 44, you need to go somewhere else, right? Uh, and now we're getting into this roadside devices, dedicated short range communications, sending the same information, closures, speeds, travel times, to roadside devices, and they can send it to connected vehicles. That's becoming a big thing. That's what we're trying with the patrol pilot. Um, and then I think probably. For the foreseeable future, we're going to be really focused on putting it out as an API. Every layer that you see on OGO, whether it's in the app or whether it's on the website, the travel times, the weather, the incidents, construction, all those layers, we're working on an API to just put that out to the public. Again, if people want to use our travel time system, great. But if Waze wants to use it, if Google Maps wants to use it, if TomTom wants to use it, and they do because they ask, if they all want to use it, we're happy to provide that to them. It's, and, and they like our data because we have traffic experts watching it, right? So that's, that's, you can see how technology just continues to evolve and become more and more efficient. So. Have you guys reached out to like the um, Truckers Association and trying to get that, get this information pushed into their dispatching type people at all? I yes. Think, I mean, it's kind of a different Yeah, and we're, we've actually, um, we're partnered with them on a couple projects, one of which is our truck parking project. 
uh, where we're, we now just put a new layer under OGO that says where the available truck parking spots are. We have a dedicated URL for that that we can send to the trucking. So they've been in, they've been on a couple projects with ODAT because they care about this information. Yeah, and they a lot of them use and bookmark certain regions on OGO uh, specifically for dispatching. So yeah, they're one of the many partners. Locals also are very interested in all this data, how it affects their 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 travel color through through their regions. Uh, yeah, any questions? Like Dave Gardner, don't take six seven you <clears throat> <laughs> Tell my secrets. <laughs> so uh, this is uh, ongoing projects that we have. We're replacing Buckeye traffic, but it's more than that. Basically, any anything that any technology that kind of runs any of these platforms, rent metering, whatever, we're going to kind of look at all of it at once and say, can we can we uh, can we bring this all into one platform? So there's going to be lots of conversations about gathering requirements. If you're invited to those, um, would love everybody's feedback. I already mentioned the OGO API we're working on. Another thing I'll touch here is the data warehouse. I have a couple slides on that. So last part of my presentation is quickly about data. Um, I can't believe I've filled this much time. Um, so uh, we do a lot of performance measures. I'm not going to cover all of them. I just want to highlight a few that tell we're worried about how we impact traffic. So let's measure how we impact traffic. Let's measure if we're making a difference. I mentioned that trip program earlier that would pay companies to quickly clear heavy vehicle accidents. So this is a sample report from that. This is a congestion, right? So you're going down the road here in the bottlenecks uh, over time on the x-axis, right? So you can see here, here we had an incident that involved a heavy vehicle. That's what the stick line is. We called the tow company. They showed up on scene here. They started the clearance activities here. And you can see all along traffic is, the queue is getting longer and longer and longer. But as soon as they started their, their, their clearance activities, it pretty much got steady. And then it started to shrink. The queue started to dissipate. And then they were completely done with the scene right here, they completed their trip, right? So we, we kind of like to see how does our timeline overlay with the impact on traffic? That's what this report tells us. Work zone mobility, this is a pretty cool one. The work zone is one of those sources that can impact traffic. We want to know when we're screwing up traffic. So we do this for every major work zone. We overlay month by month. Uh, we call this a volcano gram for obvious reasons. <laughs> month by month, what is the total number of hours that motorists were averaging under 35, meaning traffic was impacted, right? And so you can see for this specific month, we've stacked pretty high at this location. And then these two lines are saying, where were we the two years previous to this construction zone? So is it any worse than it was before? In this case, the two years previous were definitely not that bad. So we had a problem, right? Coming into this zone in this direction, because here's the limits of the zone, this thick line here, this thick line here. We have a problem, right? So now we're gonna go, we got to change some barrier around. We got to change some signage. Whatever. We're going to go look at this. We send this to our work zone folks uh, in the districts to, to take a look at that. Um, <clears throat> another thing I'll show you real quickly is the website behaves. Another performance measure we look at else, is um, what we call our snow and ice dashboard. This is where we impact how quickly do we clear traffic back to normal after it snows. This is one of ODOT's critical success factors, right? And we have a goal of two hours. It snows on your route, traffic, it snows enough that traffic gets impacted, how quickly do we get traffic back to normal? That's what this looks at. So this is a bunch of cars by month, right? So we can say, okay, each district, here's your score. Here's how many routes got impacted enough by snow, and here's how many routes you recovered within two hours. Right? So then you can come in here and you can look at, let's pick, oh, this be. <clears throat> you get this little detail, five, every five minutes in the month, how do we do, which, which routes were speeds down, right, so you can kind of slide that, or, or you can just click on one of these. Hamilton, how they do at this point, come down here. Okay, Hamilton had two events during the month of March, one on the 8th, one on the 13th. You can kind of click on these and say, Okay, on the 13th, Hamilton 275 was on the clock. It, the event started at 1540. It stopped snowing enough at 1730. It means we had two hours until 1930 to get traffic back to normal. When did we do it? We did it by 1815. Hey, that's within the two-hour goal. Great job, right? <laughs> Over here, we got a red, but you know what that means. It took longer than two hours, right? So we were supposed to get it done by 955. We could get it open until 1010. Ooh, just missed it, right? Then you can come down here and click on this and see, okay, which sections of the road uh, held you up the longest, right? Delayed your recovery. So this is this is a nice tool we give to our maintenance managers to then target their efforts. If you see a route continuously take long to recover, maybe you need to reroute some folks or whatever. That's a tool we've been running for a while, analyze some data. Um, 
I already mentioned Totus, I'm not going to mention that again. I think this is the last product I'll mention is our Tismo Data Warehouse. There were a lot of recommendations from um, the Tismo plan that said, hey, you, should, you do all these performance measures, you should do like 20 more. And it takes a lot of manual effort to run all this data. So we said, let's build a warehouse first where we pull all these disparate data sources together. And so we've been designing, working with uh, IT and central office to design this warehouse and we hired the data architect. We've finished designing the model and we're in the building phase. So later this year, we expect the warehouse to be released. And then we're gonna build the fun part on top of it, the visualization piece, right? So we can have a dashboard, interact with this data. How, how, how do we, how's travel time on your route this month versus last month? Right, that's, this is what a lot of people are excited for, but we gotta kinda step back and build the, build the warehouse first. Here's some details about it. It's cloud-based, hosts both internal and external data, 62 tables, almost 50 terabytes, that's a big boy. And nine, almost 10 billion rows of data. Turns out when you collect speed data on as much routes as we do, it adds up pretty quick. So that's our, uh, and then on top of that, we want to build a dashboard to analyze uh, how, how, trend, how we're trending when it comes to clearance times and all these, all these measures we've looked at. So we're going to wait till that dashboard is, wait till that warehouse is built and then build a dashboard on top of it. So that was it. John, this is, a, just, this is sort of an observation, sort of anecdotal, but it might be an opportunity to look at that kind of it through your construction zones and winter maintenance incidents. It, it seems like, I, I mean, pulling trailers, if, if you've ever pulled a trailer for any significant time, you're going to have an opportunity where the hitch is going to hit the road, right? So when that happens, you recognize it when you see it when someone else has done it. So we've had construction zones where, you know, we shift people over on a shoulder temporary lane, and you see these all over the place. And then I'm thinking to myself, yeah, I felt this in the car. I see that the truck went through and with the trailer and scraped the road. This has to be a nightmare when it rains or snows. Maybe, I don't know, I'm thinking another construction zone where we add a, we repave, an outside shoulder is, you know, temporary lane for a significant amount of time. But then it does this, and it does this, and you watch the vehicle dynamics, and I say to myself the same thing. This is going to be a real problem. In some cases, they don't even let, like on 670, we're not going to let trucks on that lane, on the shoulder. It's just not built for Sure. It. So, yeah. So. But, but then you look at the actual travel speeds or posted speeds, and we, we didn't build that safe enough to handle that speed right. and then I'm not going to share necessarily the location but you know I serve as an extra in snow and ice and we've got a shoulder that probably wasn't we probably didn't collect enough data on it to find out what we had to do to beef it up to get through the, con the construction process mm -hmm. and you almost lose your tandem load of salt Every time. because it's covered up and you don't know what's there and you're like wow ooh, that was fun so, so and, and anecdotally, I mean, we just hired a, a TM, right, that's sharing some of his experiences that, yeah, we probably didn't collect enough data to figure out what we needed to do to beef that shoulder up. And there seems to be a perception that districts, once we know something's going to get a major rehabilitation or a major project, right, then maintenance sort of turns its back on it. They don't want to put any funds in it. So it gets, they don't maintain it. Maybe it doesn't like operate as well. So that, those might be opportunities sure. based off the anecdote. Well, and that is a good opportunity. This is, um, that requires somebody to be thinking ahead of time, right? And being involved in those conversations that might be familiar with those ramifications. Right, right. That's a big part, not specifically with that conversation, but any conversation of what our district TISMO coordinators are supposed to be keeping an ear on all these things. So they know when someone is neglecting a certain route, they think, well, that's going to have an operational impact for X, Y, Z. So yeah, there's a lot of those types of situations that are going to be new for folks to be keeping an eye on that historically no one has been responsible for thinking that through. So, yeah. so where are your, where are you, what kind of funds, oh, this is, this is the old geek in me, but um, what kind of funds are you able to access to, to employ all these different technologies and strategies? So, or is it a cost savings because you're not doing some of the other strategies? Right. And so that's part of the difficult thing with TISMO is 
uh, it's not as obvious what the benefits are. So we've, uh, right now, the TISMO Council, Jennifer's on the TISMO Council, she can help me answer this. Right now, the answer has been any funding source of ODOT um, can consider and be eligible for TISMO projects, right? Um, one of the more practical things that has been looked at right now is the safety program. If you can, if you have a safety problem, and you can also identify that you have, a, say, for instance, a TOES problem, you have a congestion problem, <clears throat> it might beef up your ranking when you submit a safety application. Um, but quite frankly, one of the strategies we're playing with TOES right now is um, let's look at all the countermeasures. If you have an incident here, uh, clearance time, secondary, whatever, you can, we can tell you there's a problem, and you can probably reasonably estimate what solution would hit that problem, but we have no way of identifying benefits and costs right now. So we are, we just hired a consultant to help us figure that out. Um, if you're familiar with the safety program, they have what's called CMF, crash modification yeah. factors. Yeah. So the, that's what I'm, like, those, that, none of those appear. None of that exists in the TISMO world across the country right now, right. so ODOT's working on the first one right now. So then we can have a program that tells you where the problems are, and what the expected benefits and costs are, then it becomes much easier to attribute funding to that, whether it's safety program or otherwise. Yeah, so like for instance, if you're looking at the safety program, you always have to do the benefit cost ratio analysis right. and all that. How long do you do that? The best we have right now is a tool <laughs> that the feds call TOPS BC, Traffic Operations Performance Benefit Cost. And okay. if you can say, if you have yeah. another patrol truck here, they give you an expected benefit to reliability and congestion. Okay. So they, it's, the, the only problem with that tool is it's slightly higher. It's a little bit more at the planning level than it is down at the project level. So we're working on getting a couple more details to take it down to the more project level. That's the best we have right now, though. Does that safety program portion of it take into account, say, number of ac accidents or incidents at a location? Yeah, that's, that's the primary thing. The safety program is focused on quantity of crashes and seriousness of crashes. Correct me if I'm wrong. Whereas this is looking at congestion and impact of those crashes. So even if you don't have a high number, they might have a high impact on traffic. So it, it fits, they kind of sister, and they've been men together pretty well. I don't know if you want to add on to that, Jennifer. No, I mean, I think we've always struggled with, because when you have a operations problem or a congestion problem and it does have the safety, and it does have the crashes, then you're, it's easy to jump to that safety funding. But there's times that you'll get benefits from operational op opportunities that you might not have the numbers of crashes there on the safety program. And so we've tried to use the safety program for some of that, and it's just kind of a, a middle ground. So I think getting those factors will help, you know, really determine how much we want to actually invest in that and what benefit you're getting. Because there can be crashes in a location where you don't really have the slowdown traffic because it's got extra lanes, it's got your, your, your berms, and so, you know, they can get things off of the highway, but maybe multiple crashes are happening there. Well, I think the other part you'll have a hard time with, I'm sure you know, is if you have, say, especially in a lot of the rural areas where you wouldn't normally have a safety issue problem, but now for some reason, now you have a jackknife semi, and now you, for that one, that one blip accident, you now have a serious problem. Mm -hmm. So how do you maintain, you know, like your, your, uh, your trip program yeah is great for those instances because you don't know where those are going to occur. Yeah, and part of that is we've been fortunate to get enough of operating monies historically to run all the programs we mentioned. And as long as we continue to get that operating money, we'll be able to maintain those incident, those statewide programs. We want to get it down to project level at some point, um, and that's where we're going to have to identify different funding sources. And we're not there yet. <clears throat> some things like that where it's in a rural area, you might have a very, very low cost solution that right. would help mitigate future instances of that. But you've um, got to have it in place before it occurs. You've got to, you've got to, yeah, exactly. There's got to be something in place there for signing, whatever, for alternate routes. And that doesn't have to be, that just has to be thought of and put in place. So, good questions. Yeah? So, <coughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> um, does your, uh, your data warehouse model, um, is, that, is that including all your uh, ramp metering? and uh, signal data? Are you pulling all that into one location? Right now, it does not have ramp metering or signal data. It has speed, incidents, weather, uh, assist for the freeway safety patrol. Um, there's a couple other small things. The big ones are speed and weather incidents. Um, 
<coughs> Signals is on the list to go next. Um, they're working on some upgrades to get more of their data. Because they have a lot of data that um, doesn't necessarily tell you how it's impacting the traffic. They're starting to collect more and more data, data on the signal side that now how is this, how is this operating, right? How many, what percentage of people can arrive on a green that actually impact the traffic? Um, not just like when was the last time this was um, three, three times or something. So they're working on more of the output-based data and then we're gonna put that into the warehouse. <clears throat> but yeah, there's like seven or eight different data sources right now for this first version, but we're building it in a way that you can add a lot more in the future. So I know that there's a, an ongoing snow removal optimization um, program or pilot through, I think, three search. I don't know where that's going. Mm -hmm. Are you involved in that part and uh, in the overall planning of that? And in the future, um, are there any plans to have more event data, real-time data to, you know, you have your, your prioritization of routes, but in, with a particular event that might happen more dynamically reprioritized based on the event. So you're talking about the route optimization project. Our group is not specifically involved in that, but that is definitely a TISMO strategy. It's sure. talked about at maintenance conferences. It fits the bold. Um, I think they scaled back the initial scope of that from what I've heard, but they do have full plans to make it more of a real-time storm-by-storm tool. Um, that, that makes all the sense in the world. That's doing, making your system work better by being more efficient. So that fits right in with what this TISMO stuff is. That's a good point about TISMO is, a lot of what we do is TISMO, we don't even know it. And that's really what we're trying to build long term, is just to embed it into the culture and, and then plan for it a little bit. That's really our big focus right now. So it happens without even people knowing it is, and completely fine with that. Yeah. A question on the data warehouse here is your API directly accessing that data? So there's the, this is getting a little bit out of my comfort zone, but there is a cube being built on top of the warehouse, and then that cube more brings in the information and can spit it out in more of like an API format. But Jay, I don't know if anybody else wants to speak up about that, but yeah, it's like the warehouse itself is just holding the data, is a lot of it. But then the cube on top of it, as I understand it, is what is going to allow us to actually pull the information out of the warehouse and share that with others. And uh, APIs could be free to use? Yeah, yeah, so far, we've been, all the data sources we've put in here, we haven't run into any limitations. There will be limitations on some of the speed data with who we can share that with to the public. The rest of it, <clears throat> we've been very fortunate, we're going to be able to share the information out. And that's our goal, we want to share it with uh, Smart City, of Columbus Operating System, we want to share it with all these um, app developers, auto manufacturers, we want to, we want to give it out to everybody um, and let them share the information how they want, with whatever technology they want. And one more for you. Um, do you guys, since you're uh, you know recording the events of when you change your variable speed limits, um, are you guys or have you considered um, also taking screenshots from milestone snapshots to plug in with? Here's what the conditions look like when we change this. Good question. We have. No. You're putting video into there too now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. no, Do you know good. how much bigger that data's going to get? Uh, they, yeah, I, I support milestone. <laughs> <laughs> that's a good question because that's one of the decision factors being yeah. used right. uh, that isn't necessarily uh, like text-based data. That's an image. So, But there's no reason not to export that. Uh, that's a good question. We haven't considered that. But it's not a bad idea. Yeah. I know that but all they've done is you know, their usual export data um, that, from video from interesting incidents that have a lot of speech drop, that's about it. That's a, that's a, good, that's a good point. All right, one more question there. He doesn't care. All right, go. <laughs> what about the legal side of your variable speed limit? Have you had any response or pushback from the court systems or anything when those speed limit tickets we got, have gone? So we got the legislative authority to do this. It's written in the Ohio Revised Code. Right, but has that been here pushed? Here. It has not. We've got no pushback that I'm aware of for that. That's where I think your snapshot of right. how our decision making was, you know, this this is our protocol. One, Here's one, proof of how we follow our protocol. Boom. Yeah, you can't fight that ticket. One of the biggest, uh, I think one of the biggest reasons that it was successful the first year is because all the local government agencies in that area were completely on board with it because they were fed up with the problem. Right. And we, whereas other states got pushback from the patrol and other folks, other partners, we did not. 
Everybody was like, let's do this. Noaka, sheriffs, patrol, everybody. If you figure a 50 car incident, yeah. I think that's it the helps. on board. <laughs> yeah. Good point. Good point. All right. Thanks, guys. Yeah, if I remember right, the first